at its core, this channel is about a guy who back in 2015, late 2015, bought an A6000 and then bought a bunch of accessories and lenses for it. And what turned out as a photography hobby turned into a quasi career, if you want to call it that. And even today, the most common question that I get from you guys is what camera should I get if I'm just starting out? What lens should I get if I'm just starting out? And what should I buy if I'm on a budget? So. That's the question that I'm going to answer in this video and I'm gonna take it quite literally. I bought a camera and a lens uh, about three or four weeks ago for the purpose of this video. So you'll see what I paid, how I bought them. This is what I bought, the camera body A6100 and the lens, the Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4, which should come as no surprise for those of you who have followed my channel for any length of time. Now, if you just came to see the camera and the lens, this is it. But I think that this video gets a whole lot more interesting when I discuss my rationale and my overall thoughts in purchasing this lens over other lenses and this camera over other cameras. So let's start with the camera body itself. This is the A6100 that I bought just a month ago or so for this video. I paid $490 for it on eBay, but after taxes, it's $541 USD. It's used, but advertised as only 200 clicks on it in the listing. And indeed, I checked it and snapped the 162nd photo with this camera, which is nothing. It's like a brand new camera body. And the condition is flawless, no scratches or blemishes to mention. Now what's great about buying the A6100 in 2023 is that prices are a bit more down to earth. You guys may remember I did a video sometime in 2020 when I couldn't buy one of these cameras for less than a thousand dollars even used. Now it's about $500, which I think is incredible value. So the question is why the A6100 why not the more expensive A6400, A6600? Why not the ZV-E10? Why not a full frame camera body? Why not a smaller one inch sensor body? Uh, and I will say this, I have a lot and I have owned a lot of camera bodies over the course of this YouTube channel. At one point in time, I had all six of the APS-C lineup for a comparison video. And in fact, I did own all six of those camera bodies. And since then, I've kind of traded some of them off for other newer camera bodies. And I guess the point that I'm trying to get to is the fact that out of all of the cameras that I've owned and that I currently own, the A6100 is by far the one that I use most often that I've taken the most photos with, that I've done the most video work with. And really the reason is the A6100 is just as good for photo and video work as the A66 and the A64 and the ZV-E10 for that matter. So why would I not recommend the cheaper A6000? Well, because I don't think that the savings is quite worth it. Let me start by saying that in most cases, you'll save about $100 US if you are looking for a used A6000 versus an A6100. So 400 for an A6000 or 500 for an A6100, to me is a no brainer, get the A6100. If you walk into your local Best Buy and want to buy a camera there, first of all, probably a bad idea, but check out the price of the A6000 here, still in 2023. Next, there are some big improvements and advantages to having an A6100 over an A6000. The color science, first of all, is vastly better and improved. Battery life is significantly better. Overheating in video is solved. You have better video codecs. You can record in 4K instead of just 1080p. And I'm not saying that the A6000 is a bad camera. I know a ton of people who still use it and still love it and it's a camera that started it all for me and for many others out there. But again, the A6100 is simply better for not much more money. But Arthur, why not pick up the ZV-E10, which is a newer, better camera body, so they say anyway on YouTube. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Now, if you guys don't know, the ZV-E10 is kind of a more video focused mini APS-C camera. So it's similar to the A6100, but Again, it's geared more towards videography, has the little flippy screen, whereas this one doesn't have the flippy screen, it just does the tilt. The biggest deal with the ZV-E10 is it has built-in EIS or electronic image stabilization. So for video work, you can stabilize your footage and make it look better, which is a big deal, but there are some drawbacks to this. First and foremost, and the biggest thing for me, the viewfinder, electronic viewfinder that you see on this, which means you can put your eye up here and see what you're shooting. 
does not exist on the ZV-E10, which is a big, big shortcoming. If you are using these cameras for photography, if you're outside on a sunny day and you're trying to snap a photograph, that viewfinder is priceless, honestly. Uh, it's annoying that it's not included on this camera, and I do miss it when I take this out and I'm trying to take photographs. The other thing is there's a couple of other small quirks that I don't really like about this camera. The fact that Sony removed a whole bunch of functional buttons, and I mean functional as in real function buttons, and then other buttons that have functional purposes, just makes this camera more difficult to use out in the wild than the a6100. Add to that, it's a little bit more expensive. Even out on the used market, you're looking at $600 versus about $500. And to me, that electronic stabilization, as great as it is, you have to do it in post, but you have to do it before you put together and edit your YouTube video. So again, I would much rather spend the extra $100 and buy a cheap gimbal, use an A6100 and have stable video versus using this handheld and then having to go in manually, one by one, stabilize all the clips and then export them, put them into Premiere and then edit. It's just more of a hassle. And the last justification is why would you not go out and spend the money on a full frame Sony mirrorless camera right here? And this is perhaps the most fun one to answer because it makes the most people angry or upset or uncomfortable, whatever it is. But I'm gonna start out with some facts. Fact is, most people don't need a full frame mirrorless camera. They just don't. Fact is most people who have a full frame Sony mirrorless camera, they're not pushing the camera to its limits. They really aren't. Most people who have an APS-C camera in most situations are not pushing that camera to its limits. These cameras are very, very capable. And even in my eyes, I think that they are too capable for me and you can call me an amateur, you can call me a professional, whatever it is. Now there are two reasons why people buy full frame cameras or why you should consider buying a full frame camera in general. Number one is low light performance. Because the sensor on this camera is larger than the sensor on this, that means it gathers more light. So if you're working in the dark, if you're shooting video or photos in the dark, this is gonna give you better images and better video. And the second reason is similar, but if you're taking pictures of, let's say, a person portrait work and you want super duper blurry backgrounds, this is gonna give you more subject separation and a narrower focal plane. So uh, at an equivalent focal length, the full frame camera will give you a different look if that's what you're about. So you have to ask yourself two questions. Are you going to be shooting outside in the dark to where a camera that's gonna offer you maybe 20% better performance, is that going to be a routine thing for you to where you'll see that improvement? Or are you going to be photographing people where a 20% smoother background or more blurry background is gonna make a difference to you or a client that is paying you? And I'll say this here because I think this is important and needs to be said. Most people who are out there buying the newest, best, greatest, most expensive full-frame mirrorless cameras are more gearheads than they are professionals. And I say this not in a negative way, but from experience, because I have several people in my family who are photographers. That's what they do for a living. And I can't even have a conversation with them about cameras or gear because they don't know anything about cameras or gear. They have their one camera that they love, that they've always used. They have one lens that they use, usually a prime, 35, 50, 75, 85, whatever it is. That's their one go-to lens and that's all they want. And I ask them, do you want to upgrade? Do you want something better? No, they don't. They simply don't. They're happy with what they have and their work is constantly improving the actual photography or the actual skill side of their business. On the flip side, I talk to people who are wearing a Sony A1, $6,000 with a nice G Master for a couple thousand dollars on it and I ask them what they do for a living and they have an office job but they like to do photography on the weekends. And again, I'm not saying this in a bad way because there are certainly professionals out there who have the newest and the best gear, and that's great. I applaud them for doing that and having that. I'm just saying that there's a big section of people who just like having the newest gear. I mean, I'm one of them. I am all about getting the newest and greatest camera bodies, mostly to share that with you guys, but also because I'm genuinely interested in seeing where 
this stuff goes, where the camera industry goes and where lens manufacturing takes us. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the gear that you have does not define or even indicate the level of talent that you have. I'm more impressed with someone who can take an amazing shot with a cheap APS-C camera and lens than I am impressed with a photo taken by someone with a $12,000 camera setup. Now, does the gear help? Absolutely. But I think at a certain point, the expensive gear becomes an excuse not to focus on refining your skills and that is bad. If you don't have to think anymore because your camera does all of the thinking for you, are you really a photographer? And what I found, especially with APS-C cameras and lenses compared to full frame, is after APS-C, you get an increasingly diminishing return for every additional dollar that you spend. I mean, the curve is pretty flat towards the end, meaning that if you buy a good camera body that's an APS-C with a good lens, you can perform almost as well as a full frame setup at half the price, maybe a third of the price. What you get for double and sometimes triple your money with a full frame camera is not double or triple better in comparison. Sometimes it's not even better at all. So for most people, especially those just starting out, the APS-C size sensor is going to be more than enough to start out your photography and your video journey. And this will allow you for many, many years of growth and development and building up your skill set. So that's the camera body. This is what I recommend for the bunny if you are starting out. And look, I think we are on the cusp of some new camera bodies from Sony. I really do. I think we should see some new APS-C bodies out soon with improvements and features that will be very compelling. But if you're new, if you're starting from zero, and you don't want to spend more than you have to, the A6100 is still the best solution. And now on to the lens. So this is the Sigma 16mm f1.4 contemporary series lens that came out in 2017 and probably is the most popular lens available for Sony APS-C E-mount. I'd like to think that I'm part of the reason for that because this is the lens that I've recommended to more people than any other lens that I've ever recommended. And that says a lot. I did a video a couple of years ago, uh, if I could only have one lens, which one would it be? It was this one. Now, if I were to remake that video today, I'd probably change my opinion a little bit because I am a big fan of the new Sigma 18 to 50 and it's a little bit more usable, but for the money, you simply cannot beat this lens right here. In fact, when I look back at all the photos that I've taken over the years, the majority of them, the vast majority of them were taken with this 16 millimeter Sigma. It's a very sharp lens. It focuses well and quickly. It offers nice subject separation, even though it's a wide field of view. It's a wide angle, so you can use it in almost any situation and the results speak for themselves. It does everything well and is an extremely versatile lens for being a prime, meaning that you can't zoom in or out because I still get that question sometimes. Yo, I bought a Sigma 16 millimeter. How do I zoom? You can't bro. You just can't. This one in particular was one I picked up used as well about three weeks ago and I paid a nice $230 US for it used on the photo market forum on Reddit. It's a great place to look if you're trying to pick up a lens or a camera for cheap from someone else. No sales tax, so altogether for the camera body and the lens, I am in this setup for $771 US. Give yourself another $15 for an SD card, that's $785 or so all in. Now is this the best lens out there? Probably not, and undoubtedly there will be better lenses released out in the future, but for the money, I think, honestly, you cannot beat it. For $230 especially used, there's nothing out there that will ever come out that will beat this in terms of performance, in terms of build quality, in terms of optics, whatever it is. The one thing that I will say is that I do, as I mentioned before, really like the new 18 to 50 from Sigma. It's a zoom lens, constant f2.8, but the problem with this lens is that even used, it's expensive. It's four to $500 versus $230. So that's why I didn't put it in this video. But if you have a little bit more money, check this one out. The other thing is because this is a prime lens, meaning you can't zoom in or out, it forces you to zoom with your feet and really think about composition, where stuff is, rule of thirds, all of that stuff. So it forces you to become a better photographer to use it. 
which I think is a good thing as well. So altogether, this is simply a financially smart and functionally brilliant setup. You don't need much more for starting out your photography and video journey. This is the camera and the lens that I use to film probably over 50% of my YouTube videos. When my wife started her workout channel, this was the camera and the lens that she used. In fact, this entire video that you've been watching has been filmed using an A6100 and the Sigma 16 millimeter, but these are my own that I've owned for the past four or five years. And it's great, honestly. In a small room like this, for the purposes of making YouTube videos, you cannot get anything better, I think, even by spending double money. The goal at the end of all of this is hopefully you start out, you get this camera and lens and you use it to make awesome videos and take amazing pictures for paying clients. And then you grow your business and slowly upgrade what you need, lights, gimbals, studios, whatever it is. And then you can check out more expensive cameras and lenses, but you don't need the best of the best in the beginning. You simply don't. And even if you never do something professionally, even if you are just snapping photos and capturing family moments, I can't tell you how amazing it is to have these memories. It's a moment that is one four hundredth of a second that's frozen in time but carries so much emotion and feeling behind it. That's why I bought my A6000 in the first place. My goal was never to become some YouTuber and show off my skills to some audience. My goal was to take some good pictures of my family and to save those memories because I knew we only have a finite time on this great big green and blue ball that we call Earth. And I think I'm going to end it right there. I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned for more. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.